Hey everybody. So if you think back to chapter 10, we said that we could have these unexpected changes in aggregate supply or aggregate demand. We could have these different shocks in the two curves. The thing about the ISLM model is it allows us to see where aggregate demand shocks come. And so in the case of an IS shock, an unexpected change in the IS curve is just going to be an exogenous change in that total demand for goods and services. It's going to be an exogenous change in the way people want to spend their money. So there are a variety of examples that we could use for this. One example would be a sudden crash in the stock market. And so if suddenly stocks are a lot lower than they were previously, it's going to decrease everybody's wealth. And when people have lower wealth, they're obviously going to consume less. So a stock market crash can lower aggregate demand by presenting itself as an IS shop. Similarly, if people suddenly become very bearish on the economy, they don't think the economy is going to do very well in the coming months, that can be a shock to business confidence and reduce investment or reduce consumption spending. And all of that in this model is going to show up as an IS shock. On the other hand, we can have LM shocks. And an LM shock is just going to be an exogenous change in the way people hold money versus the way people spend money in the, IS, in the IS curve. And so an example of an LM shock could be something like people wanting to get away from credit cards and get back into cash because of something like credit card fraud. It could be easier availability of cash alternatives. So there, maybe there's more ATMs around. Maybe people have started to switch to Venmo. All of that is gonna present itself as an LM shock in the in the ISLM model. And so a really great example of this was the recession that the US had in 2001. So during 2000, the recession of 2001, unemployment went up really, really quickly in a really short amount of time. Unemployment went from below 4% to almost 6% in a matter of months. And at the same time, GDP growth cratered. It was at 4% and slowed to less than 1%. There were a variety of causes for this to happen. The first one is a decline in the stock market. We've heard a lot about the dot-com bubble in the late 90s. The dot-com bubble burst in the early 2000s. And so we can see that the NASDAQ was really, really high right around 2000 and then suddenly crashed. And shortly thereafter, we had a recession. Basically, people weren't as wealthy. And because of that, consumer spending decreased. Similarly, something like 9-11 would have been a really, really significant shock to consumer confidence. It increased uncertainty. People didn't know necessarily what the future was going to look like, and all of that decreases consumer and business confidence. That's going to lower spending. After a big event like that, you're probably going to hold on to cash a little bit more, and that's going to shift IS to the left. You're not going to spend as much money. At the same time, we had a big wave of corporate accounting scandals. Enron was a big one. WorldCom happened around then, and all of that reduced stock prices, but it also made people a little bit more fearful about investing and about spending their money. They didn't know if they could trust the companies where they were putting their money. That discouraged investment and discouraged total spending. So in response to this, the government took a couple of different policy responses to try to get the economy out of that recession. First, the government undertook a fiscal policy response. They tried to cut taxes. The Bush administration decreased taxes in 2001 and 2003. And at the same time, they increased government spending. They bailed out the airline industry. They spent a lot on reconstructing New York City. And then obviously there was an increase in government spending associated with the Afghanistan war. All of that was meant to increase consumer spending through that tax cut and even increased consumer confidence with something like an industry bailout so that people could once again have faith in the companies where they were gonna spend their money. But at the same time, the Fed decreased interest rates. They tried to counteract this decline in total spending by giving people more money to spend. They cut interest rates and increased the total money supply really, really quickly. So back here in 2000, we saw that interest rates were about 6%. But pretty quickly, the Fed identified that the economy was going into recession and started to decrease the interest rate really, really drastically. So if at the start of 2001, the interest rate was 6%, by 
by the end of 2001, the interest rate had fallen all the way to about one and a half percent. The Fed acted really, really quickly and cut interest rates to try to increase spending and provide people the cash they needed to spend. And so we talk a lot about the Fed changing interest rates and changing money and changing the money supply. And it kind of gets difficult to keep straight which one the Fed's really focused on, right? So a lot of times, especially in places like the Wall Street Journal, they report Fed policies, changes in the interest rate, as if the Fed just mandates changes in the interest rate. They wave a magic wand and suddenly the Fed funds rates lower than it was. But in, in reality, the Fed targets the Fed funds rate, which is really just the overnight interest rates that bank char banks charge one another. But they target the Fed funds rate. So they increase and decrease the total amount of money supply and they shift the LM curve to try to achieve their desired interest rate. So they use the money supply to target the interest rate. If they want interest rates to go down, they increase the money supply until the interest rate is where they want it to be. And when they do that, that typically moves other short-term rates. And so if the Fed changes an overnight interest rate, typically something like a three-month rate also goes down. And then because the three-month rate went down, the one-year rate goes down. And because the one-year rate goes down, the four-year rate, the five-year rate goes down, and so on and so on. So you're probably asking, all right, so the FUD clearly targets interest rates. Everybody reports this all the time, but why? So they target the interest rates for a couple of reasons. Uh, first, interest rates are far, clear, far easier to measure than the money supply. Interest rates are presented every single day, and it's very clear what an interest rate is. We talked in chapter four about how it gets kind of muddy what money really is in the modern world. Is Venmo money? Are demand deposits money? The money supply gets really, really muddy. But at the same time, the Fed thinks that LM shocks, that changes in money demand, tend to be more common than IS shocks. And so if the Fed targets interest rates, they, get a, they do away with LM shocks. All changes in money demand are immediately accommodated by changes in the money supply. And so that total LM curve doesn't actually move. And so targeting interest rates actually stabilizes the economy better. The primary drawback of this is obviously that interest rates don't really go a lot below zero. That we tend to run into the zero lower bound problem that you hear a lot about. And so the Fed, when they get stuck at zero, usually they have to undertake these unconventional monetary policies. Basically, all that is, is trying to increase the money supply, even though it's not going to change interest rates. So we can see, we can see the zero lower bound in our ISLM model. And so if the Fed is at the zero lower bound, it means our equilibrium is stuck at zero. Basically, it means our LM curve looks something like this. And our IS curve looks something like this. So clearly interest rates are pretty much at zero, right? They're not gonna go much below that. And because our interest rates are at zero, the Fed shifting the LM curve to the right isn't really gonna do a whole lot. It's not gonna lower interest rates and it's not really gonna increase income. And so the primary rationale behind these policies like quantitative easing is just to make sure that the money supply is always going up. It's to hope that by giving people more money, eventually they'll just spend it. Eventually it won't have to show up as an interest rate, but people would just start increasing consumer spending because there's just more money in the economy. So that's the primary rationale that the Fed had in 2008 and 2009 when it undertook quantitative easing. And the primary rationale the Fed's had here recently with the coronavirus in trying to increase the total amount of money via quantitative easing once again. 